Today's passage is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, a well-known uh, passage for many people. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So there are particular moments in history where when we hear about them, we remember exactly where we were when we heard it. I can remember uh, exactly where I was. I was in a tiny apartment that I was uh, renting in the first year of uni when my housemate told me that Princess Diana had died. I remember being in a large share house, which we uh, intimately called the cubby, uh, a couple of years later when a friend of mine said to me that a plane had flown into a building in America. And I remember exactly where I was. I was driving away from my house at the time in the northern suburbs uh, where I thought, oh, I'll turn on the radio. I turned on the radio and I heard the king of pop had died. Now, because I'd only just turned on the radio, I hadn't heard the start of the news article. And so I hadn't heard who had actually died, just that the king of pop had died. And not being really that au fait with pop culture and, you know, up to date with all the music and everything, I thought, I wonder who that is. And they kept going and they weren't really telling me who it was. And I thought, okay, king of pop, king of pop, who would it be? First person I thought of was Michael Jackson. And sure enough, he had passed away. And while I was not pleased that someone's life had been lost, I was really impressed with myself that I had known who that was because I didn't think I was going to get it. This idea of a king. Sometimes people are called king because they inherit it. It's part of their royal line. But sometimes we give this title the king of pop, someone who was so good. They were the best in their field. They had power. They had influence in this field because they were so good. We had the king of spin when uh, anyone who, who is around cricket knows. And even today in our news, as uh, we heard about the changes in Channel 9's news set up, Peter Hitchener was referred to as the king of Melbourne news. We give this title to someone who has power, someone who has influence, someone who is at their best. The top, the ultimate. And today we're going to be looking at Christ the King, Jesus being the King of our lives. And so what does this term King really mean? What does it mean for us here in Australia? Because let's be honest, you can't have gone throughout the last year or so without realizing we have a King now. And yet he's thousands of kilometers away. He's in another country. We, we don't hear that much about him. We're not as you know, avid about following the royal family as a lot of people say in England. What, what does that mean for us? We do have leaders though. We have people of influence in our world, but we are so fortunate to live in a country that is relatively at peace and that we have the opportunity to vote. We have the opportunity to have our say. We can all have a voice in what we believe and what we think and what we think should happen. And so when we hear this prophecy that's given in Isaiah, that there will be someone who comes, the government will be on his shoulders. It gives us a little bit of an idea of, well, what does that mean for us? 
Because to have a bit more of an idea of the context that Isaiah was speaking into, it helps us to understand the importance of these words. You see, the king at the time had the power of life and death in their hands. The decisions that they made, the influence and the power that they held could literally mean life and death for people within their nation or people in other nations. And while we don't necessarily see that here in Australia, we can even see that today in other countries, that the decisions that the leaders make can mean life or death for other people. And it was the same at the time that Isaiah was speaking. So he was speaking this to, to God's people, actually the southern nation of Judah, and they were at the point where because of the decisions that they had made and the le that their leaders had made, they had turned from God and they had felt that God had turned from them. They weren't sure whether he was for them or against them, but there was a mighty nation, the Assyrians, who were strong and powerful. And the people were fearful of them. They didn't know whether to join them or fight against them. And there were other nations that were trying to persuade them to join them so they could fight the Assyrians. They were at a point where leadership was so important to their future, to the people's future and what was gonna happen. They were at a turning point and what were they to do? You see, Leaders can have an incredible influence. Patrick Miller, who uh, speaks into one of uh, a podcast, 10 Minute Bible Talks, this isn't a direct quote, but this is basically what he was saying. Every tyrant's greatest weapon is death. We see it in wars and arguments. The greatest threat someone can make is to take someone's life. This makes sense when we think of, of bullies, when we think of gangs, when we think of one country or territory taking over another, the greatest threat that they can have is to take someone's life. This is what the people were experiencing in the time where Isaiah was speaking into. And yet what was his message to them? It wasn't a message of death and destruction. He says, but for to us, a child is born. It wasn't death, it was speaking of a life and a life that was gonna make an impact, not just for them, but for all time. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This isn't something that's going to stop, it's going to end, it's going to keep on going. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom from that time on and forever. This is a message of hope. It's a message of something that is not just for the people there, but for all their generations to come. Can you hear the purpose and the hope and the possibility of what this new governor is going to bring, what this new leader is going to be? And so who is this new leader? Who, what is he gonna be like? What is going to happen? Now, these people at this time had to wait a couple of hundred years before they experienced or heard, no doubt from heaven, about Jesus Christ being born. We live 2,000 years later and can still see throughout Scripture and all the prophecies and through the Gospels that Jesus Christ truly was the, the child to be born, truly was the one who would come and change humanity. And this is what was spoken of him, that he would be a wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we're just gonna take a couple of minutes to unpack what some of these words mean because it helps us to understand who Jesus is today and the possible king that we have access to today as well. So to begin with, he's called a wonderful counsellor. Now, I've heard this passage pretty much every year when it comes to Christmas time 
But this idea of a wonderful counsellor, when we hear it in today's words, we often think, oh, wonderful counsellor, someone who is caring, someone who listens to you, someone who is compassion, someone who helps you talk through your feelings. Now, Jesus is definitely that. However, a different understanding of the interpretation of this world, word's wonderful counsellor. Uh, Daryl Dash, a, a pastor from the States, says, it's actually more like a military strategist. It probably refers to a king who has the ability to come up with a winning military strategy. You could say extraordinary strategist. In fact, the New English Testament, uh, translation actually has, instead of wonderful counsellor, it has extraordinary strategist, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I don't know how Handel's Messiah would cope with that change come Christmas time or the carols that we sing, but that gives us a greater understanding of what this word is, not just someone who comes alongside and gives comfort. Our King, Christ, the Messiah is an extraordinary strategist. Can you imagine the hope that that would bring to the people at the time? When they are struggling to know what is the right way, what is the best decision to make for their future, what decisions do they need to make for their nation? To have someone come in who sees the bigger picture, who has a greater vision, who can see not just the next step, but the many steps for all eternity ahead. What a great comfort to the people at the time. But I read that and I think, what a great comfort to me today. Because how often do I find myself in a situation where I am struggling to know the right decision to make? Let's be honest, if all our decisions were good versus bad, then it would make our decisions a lot easier to make. But often, probably 99% of the time, it's not a, a decision against good or evil, but they're decisions that are important to our lives, whether it's to do with our jobs, our careers, our family, our relationships the location that we live in, the church that we attend, what to do with our finances, what to do with our time. These decisions, they're all big decisions that we all have to make. And sometimes when it comes to a big decision, it is so hard to know, it is so hard to navigate. I often say to people when we're trying to make a decision, if we could predict the future, this would be a really easy decision to make, wouldn't it? We can't, but we have a king who sits on the throne. Jesus Christ, who was prophesied to be called an extraordinary strategist, who loves us, cares for us, knows us better than we know ourselves, desires for us to make the best decisions that we can make and draws close to us to give us wisdom and guidance and discernment when it comes to making decisions in our lives. Wonderful counsellor, an extraordinary strategist, that is the king who sits on our throne. But not just that, he's also called the mighty God and everlasting father. Now this term, everlasting father, a, a closer translation would be father of eternity, forever and ever. Now if you think of a wonderful counsellor, that could be uh, accredited, a, an extraordinary strategist could be accredited to another human. To be honest, I know a few people who are incredible about forward thinking and visionary but to be called that as well as mighty God and everlasting father, this puts this future king in a totally different realm. This means that this person, this king, this child that's to be born, this one where the government will be on his shoulders, this one who will last forever, isn't just in human form, but is a deity in himself. The people at the time wanted an extraordinary leader, 
they received God himself. Colossians 1 speaks beautifully about the, the, the deity of who Jesus is. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the King, Jesus Christ, who is still on the throne, who still desires to be the King of our lives today. He has not just an incredibly strategic mind, he has the fullness of God within him. What greater power do we need? What greater authority and incredible gifts and abilities do we need than God himself in our king? It reminds me of... Um, when I, a previous job that I had, I traveled quite a bit and I went to a number of different countries, particularly developing countries. It was an aid organization that I, I worked for. And there were two particular situations that I remember that I found myself in a situation that caused great fear and concern within me and I really wasn't sure what the next couple of hours or the next couple of days would hold for me. The first situation where this happened, I wasn't on my own. My companion was our IT guy. Now, I have nothing against IT guys. However, to give you a bit of an understanding of the situation I was in, if he and I competed in an arm wrestle, I reckon I could have taken him. But not so much that, even more importantly, when I shared with him my concerns, my fears, how uncomfortable I was, when I highlighted the situation that we were in, he had no idea. He was totally oblivious to the situation that we were in and the decisions that we had to make. Now, the second time I was in a similar situation, Again, I wasn't on my own, and my travel partner was actually the director of the department that I worked in. And when I shared with him my fears and my concerns about what was going on, he was so aware of it that he had already contacted a 24-hour international travel agent that he had access to. And he had assured me that if Whatever happened, the organization that we worked for, outside paying a ransom, would do anything that they could to help us and to get out of the situation we were in. And to give you a fair comparison, if I competed against him in an arm wrestle, I'd give him a run for his money, but I reckon he would have won. Can you imagine me in these situations, who I would rather be with? Can you kind of imagine the greater peace and assurance I had when I was side by side with someone who had power, someone who had authority, someone who had wisdom, someone who had traveled before and had the connections to help us make better decisions from that point on. That is like when we have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over our life. 
That is what it's like when we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and greater power than a travel agent and finances that he has within him. So that when we hit a time of crisis, when we come to grief and challenges, that we know we have access to a God who loved us so much that he gave up everything to be our king, not just when he was here on earth, but for all eternity. He is a wonderful counselor, an extraordinary strategist. He's a mighty God and an everlasting father, and he is the prince of peace. Now, as I mentioned before, the greatest weapon of a tyrant is death. This is what people saw played out all the time in the time that Isaiah was speaking into. We hear about it and see it today. The greatest threat someone can make is to take someone's life. But it goes on and Patrick Miller says, Jesus's greatest weapon was to forgive people's sins. And he did that by sacrificing himself and conquering death. And in doing so, he stole every tyrant's greatest weapon. He is not just a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. When our world sets out to get power and control through death and destruction, Jesus came and he ruled and he exerted his power through grace and love and forgiveness. And instead of sacrificing someone else and other people experiencing death, he put himself on the cross. He allowed his own death so that death could be conquered and he could be on the throne forever and ever. That is the power of Christ the King. That is the power of a God who loves us, that he gave us Jesus so that he could be king over our lives. So that no matter what happens, what decisions we need to make, what happens in this world, the death and the destruction that we experience every day, we have someone on the throne who is greater and more powerful and leads with love and grace and forgiveness rather than the death and destruction that this world offers. And so my question for all of us today is who is your king? Who is your king? You're able to tell who your king is. Who has power over your life? Who do you give your allegiance to? When it comes to making decisions in your life, whether it's around finances or career or family, whatever life choices you have to make, who is speaking into your life? Who are you listening to? Who are you asking for guidance and wisdom from? Because having a king in our lives, while it seems like a bit of a foreign concept to us here in Australia, it's actually a reality for every single person's life. The late Timothy Keller, uh, who was an incredible theologian and preacher and pastor, believed that Everyone had a desire to have a king in their life. It's how we were created. He says this, why is it that in the countries that still have some kind of royalty left, some royal line, that people are obsessed with the royalty? Why is it that in lands like America, where there is no king, there is no royal line, we have to create them? So we take billionaires and we take athletes and we take media stars and we even take criminals and we turn them into kings. We crown them, they hold court, we adore them. Why is it that there is a significant part of the population that is constantly giving themselves over to the sway of dynamic, charismatic figures who abuse them 
Why is there this need for kings? And he goes on to say that there is this need within each of us. We are born with it to adore and focus and give, give honor to someone. And if you are not giving that to Christ Jesus, if he is not the king in your life, then you can be sure that someone or something else is. In fact, George MacDonald, who uh, influenced the writings of C.S. Lewis, says the one principle of hell is, I am my own. Meaning if you're not giving allegiance to someone else, you are making yourself your king. You are putting the onus on yourself that you have it all together, that you have everything that you need. And this is what our culture is so loud in saying. And I know Tim spoke on this when he looked at the, the culture that we live in. Treat yourself. We hear it all the time. It's on t-shirts. You do you. Believe in yourself. You can do anything that you want. And our culture is encouraging this idea you can be your own king. You can be your own ruler. You have everything that it takes to make all the right decisions for yourself. But if you're anything like me and you can see how broken and fallen and misguided I can be and I can feel, I need someone so much greater than myself in my life to give me direction, to give me purpose, to give me hope. When we look around at the world that we live in, and there are beautiful and wonderful things and people in our world, but there is also hurt and grief and death and destruction. I know that this world needs something greater than me to be able to bring healing and wholeness, grace, love, forgiveness, and peace. And Jesus Christ offered himself, not just for you and for me, but for all mankind, for all humans, for all time, to be our king, And when he is the king of our life, we can see it in the decisions that we make. We can see it in the peace that we have in our lives, even when our world is in chaos. We have access to a wonderful counselor, an extraordinary strategist, the mighty God and everlasting father, the fullness of him himself, and a prince of peace who desires not for death and destruction, but for love and compassion and grace and peace to reign in our lives when we put Jesus Christ on the throne of our lives. Will you stand with me as I finish and we pray?